morning, moms. Happy Mother's Day to y'all. So glad you came to church today. And uh, we are celebrating today in a very unique way. We interrupt this series in eschatology for a special Mother's Day message. So I don't always do that every year. It's been a few years since I've done it, but I decided to do one this year. So turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. So down south, in a very small town, there was a trial being held in a local courtroom. The prosecuting attorney called an elderly grandma as his first witness. The attorney asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She responded, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a boy. And frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. You lie, you cheat on your wife, you manipulate people, and you talk behind their backs. You think you're a big shot, but you haven't the brains to realize you'll never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. The lawyer was stunned when he heard that, so he, without thinking, he just pointed to the defense attorney across the room, and he said, Mrs. Jones, do you know the defense attorney? She replied, yes, I do. I've known Mr. Bradley since he was a youngster, too. He's lazy, bigoted, and he has a drinking problem. He can't build a normal relationship with anyone. He's cheated with several women, including your wife. And his law practice is one of the worst in the entire state. Yes, I know him. Well, just then, the judge immediately called the two attorneys up to the bench, leaned forward, and in a quiet voice said, if either of you idiots ask her if she knows me, I'm going to send you both to the electric chair. <laughs> Listen, most women are more gracious than that, but nobody knows you like your mother, or in this case, the mother down the street. But it is Mother's Day, and it's sort of a big deal, you know, Mother's Day. Did you know that phone traffic is up today? 37% from normal. It is estimated there will be 122 million phone calls made to moms. There will be 113 million greeting cards given to moms. I hope you got one of them, mom. It is the busiest day for restaurants. More than half of the American population will eat out for obvious reasons. And one-fourth of all flowers purchased all year long will be purchased for Mother's Day. What do moms want more than anything else? Here's what they said. Number one, they want quality time with their loved ones. 30% said they'd like sleep. Another 30% said a day off or alone time. 11% said they'd like a spa day. What do moms want the least? Uh, they said they don't want another knickknack. And yeah, we got plenty of knickknacks around here. We put them in the garage or hidden everywhere. We don't want another one of those. Uh, they say they don't want anything that says world's best mom on it. So some of you are hanging your head right now going, heck. Uh, well, they don't want that. Here's what else they don't want. They don't want a vacuum or any work-related appliance. They say they don't want bathroom scales. They don't want a gym membership. And they don't want a gift card for Botox. All of those are bad gift ideas for mom. So I'm going to put a, a picture of my mom, a few pictures, sort of a collage. So this is my mom. Upper left is when she's in her older years. There she is, smiling, laughing. And then a couple pictures with me and my kind of dumb look, uh, but I'm next to my mom. But I, I also, you know, she's been in heaven now since I think 2007 it was. Um, but uh, I do have a little recording of her laugh. It's one of the most memorable, wonderful things I have. So this is from a phone conversation I had. 
I love you. So, so that's my mom. And uh, the name of this message is How Moms Can Change the World, and she certainly changed my world in the counsel she offered, in the encouragement she gave, in the example that she showed in her tireless service for her four boys. I was the baby of those four boys. So this is a, a Mother's Day message, but it is not just for moms. This is a message for anyone who's responsible for somebody else. And I'm guessing that's probably most all of us. Anybody who wants to see the world change, that's who this message is for. We all want to see the world change. The world is only going to change one person at a time, one salvation at a time, one conversation at a time. It has been said, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. There's two great examples of that in the text that you and I are about to read. The two ladies mentioned, one is named Lois, the grandmother, the other is named Eunice, the mother, and they raised a young boy named Timothy who was handpicked by the Apostle Paul as a personal protege to lead a ministry. Let's pick it up in chapter 1, verse 1 of 2 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you and be mind, uh, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. A little bit about Timothy. Timothy was the son of a mixed marriage. His mother was Jewish, his dad was Greek. We believe he was an unbeliever. The town he was raised in was called Lystra, in an area known as Galatia, which is an area in modern-day Turkey. Paul refers to Timothy as his son. In another place, my son in the faith, or my true son in the faith. Why did he call him that? Because it was Paul who spiritually birthed him. That is, led him to faith in Christ, or at least led grandma and mom to Jesus, who in turn led him to faith. Paul mentions Timothy no less than 24 times in his writings, 24 times. And Paul is the only, uh, Timothy is the only person of whom Paul said he is like-minded. Timothy and I, we think alike. We track with each other. Well, all of that started at home, and I want to give you a little bit of insight into the home life. And what I want to show you in the text we just read are three ways to invest in your children to change the world. Three ways to invest in your children to change the world. Number one, tenderness. Invest that in them. Invest a tender heart in your kids. Look at verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I might be filled with joy. I didn't tell you this, but you need to know that when Paul wrote this letter, he probably dictated it. 
He was in prison. He had been in prison. He was released from prison. A couple of years later, they found him again, captured him, placed him in another prison called the Mamertine prison in Rome. I've been there twice, maybe three times. The Mamertine prison was a hole in the ground about 30 feet in diameter. It was a place for, it was death row. And Paul spent his final years in a hole in the ground with a tiny little hole above him where they would lower food in. Uh, He would be forced to live in his own excrement with about 30 other prisoners. He spent his last days there. It's there he wrote or dictated his final letter, which was to Timothy. So here's Paul. He's in prison. He's thinking back. He's remembering Timothy. Timothy comes to mind. What's the first thing that comes to Paul's mind when he remembers Timothy. Tears. Being mindful of your tears. He has some vivid memory of Timothy crying. Now, it's uncertain as to what that time was. It could be A, when Paul visited Timothy in Ephesus. Paul left there and put Timothy in charge of the church at Ephesus. And uh, he told him to set in order all the things that were out of order in that church. And Paul left, and probably then Timothy had, had an emotional time as Paul left. That's number one. Number two, there was a time when Paul got all of the Ephesian elders together in Acts chapter 20, and as they parted, we are told in the Bible, they wept aloud as they embraced him in farewell, sad most of all because he said that they would never see him again. What I want you to notice is that Paul writes about Timothy's emotional breakdown in the Bible. For thousands of years to come, people will read the Bible. And don't you think for some men, this could be a bit embarrassing to mention publicly? Really, Paul, did you have to mention that I cried in front of you? Maybe as he dictated this in that prison, some of the other prisoners like snickered like... He's, a, he's writing to some crybaby. Now, this is especially true for men who have been told it's not cool to cry. Big boys don't cry. One commentary that I read said, Tears from a man like Timothy were more allowable among those of Paul's era than among modern men in the West. That's true but they shouldn't be. Emotional vulnerability is not a weakness. Another term for that is sensitivity. Timothy was sensitive. He was sensitized to those that he loved. Uh, Sensitivity or tenderness is the ability to listen to another and to empathize with that person. And I'll just say, that's becoming harder to do these days. It's getting harder for people to actually feel and care and have any emotional response, even though our world is filled with heartache. The reason it's harder is because we are overexposed to it. On a daily basis, through your Twitter feed or Instagram or whatever you do online or watch on TV, you are inundated with information and images of suffering and war and heartache and hardship and after a while you grow numb to it and this is why people wisely from time to time decide I'm going to take a fast from media and and social media I'm going to spend like a month and not check my post not go online not read the news just for a while because I need to focus just on what's in front of me and get sensitized again Mother Teresa said, if I look at the masses, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. We see the masses all day long. We need to see the one. Well, Paul remembered the one who thought of the one, and that was Timothy, a man who cried. He he was tender. And I'll just say again, tenderness is a good trait in a man. Any jerk can act macho. Any 
Anyone can be cool and aloof. That's sort of the default position for a lot of men. But it's not masculine. Because even God compares himself to a mother when it comes to tenderness. In Isaiah chapter 66, a message I preached a few years ago on this text, Isaiah said, As one whom his mother comforts, this is God speaking through the prophet, As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And who did Timothy have to thank for that tenderness? I'm guessing it was mom. Because from what I can gather, Timothy's dad died when he was young. And he was raised by his grandmother and his mother. Two people typically noted for tenderness. Most people learn tenderness from mom. I learned it from my mom. My mom was a very tender, oh, she could be tough. You know, all of five foot, maybe five foot two in her high stature years, but she shrunk back down to five foot. But, but she could be tough, but gentle, tender. And one of the greatest contributions moms can give to their children is tender love. Dr. John Bowlby, a British psychiatrist, said, and I quote, the young child's hunger for his mother's love and presence is as great as his hunger for food. Her absence inevitably generates a powerful sense of loss and anger. Tenderness in a man makes him relatable, makes him credible, and makes him approachable. So tenderness, that's the first, that's the first thing to invest in your kids to change the world. Second, godliness. Godliness. Now let me take you to verse 5. After remembering his tears, after being mindful of Timothy's tears, he says in verse 5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Did you notice there's no mention of Timothy's dad in that verse? And by the way, in the book of Acts, when Timothy is first introduced, there's only one mention of his dad, and I'm going to give it to you in a moment. The reason there's no mention of his dad but a mention of grandma and mom in our text is probably because A, his dad died when he was young, or B, he abandoned the family. He walked out on a family, maybe because they believed in Jesus. He didn't want to be a part of that. In Acts chapter 16, uh, Timothy is called the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. So the faith was passed down through the mother. When Paul first came to Lystra, Paul preached. Two women were in the crowd, one named Lois, one named Eunice. Both of of them said, I believe this. It could be that Timothy did at at that time or that their faith, the faith of these two women was passed down through them onto Timothy. But here's the point I want to make. Timothy's faith was matriarchal. Came from the woman's side of his family. Mom and grandma. It was matriarchal. Now, I'll, I'll add to that and say it's always best if it can be both patriarchal and matriarchal, if dad and mom both share a vital faith in Christ, but in Timothy's case, it did not. So Paul comes to Lystra. Uh, There's Timothy, and it says, Paul had Timothy circumcised because of the Jews. What's interesting about that is that he was a Jewish boy. Now he's a Jewish adult. He had never been circumcised on the eighth day. So Paul had him circumcised as an adult because of the Jews. Now, why didn't he get circumcised as a baby? Perhaps because his father objected to it. So there probably was an unequal yoke in the home. There was a mixed marriage. Now look at verse 5 and notice the um, name of the grandmother is Lois. I'm not going to spend much time there. And your mother Eunice. Stop with that name. Eunice is the Latinized form of the Greek word unique, which means one who conquers well, or good conqueror, 
It's a good name, Good Conqueror. And um, I say she lived up to that name. She conquered the forces of a divided home, and her son became a leader. So, the second time Paul comes to Lystra, first time he came, there was salvation. The second time he comes, Timothy is now older, more mature, and something in Timothy impressed Paul to say, I want you to join my team. So Timothy came on board with the Apostle Paul. If you've come here for any length of time, you probably heard me mention a guy that I've always loved to read, a preacher who's an old dead guy from uh, last century named uh, G. Campbell Morgan. G. Campbell Morgan was in England. He had a church down the street from Westminster Abbey. He was a man of the word. He was sometimes called the Prince of Preachers. And uh, he had four sons. All four sons became preachers. So there was a family reunion. And somebody outside the family asked one of the boys, hey, who's the best preacher in the family? You know, that, that'll stir things up. Who's the best preacher? Now, they, they thought they would hear somebody say, or one of them say, well, it's my dad, or, oh, it's my brother, he's much better than I am. All four boys said, my mother is the best preacher in our family. And then G. Campbell Morgan himself said, my dedication to preaching the word was maternal. The first Bible stories I heard were from my mother. And what Morgan said happened is I would listen to my mom read the Bible. I would then go into my sister's room, line up all her dolls on the bed, and preach to them. That was my first congregation, a bunch of dolls. There's an old Scottish saying that goes like this. An ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. Let me translate that for our English-speaking audience. An ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. The mother's godly influence way outstrips any preacher's sermon, any day of the week. Godliness. In fact, look back at verse 5 and notice how Paul describes this faith. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith, that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother and your mother. Now that word, or those words, genuine faith, it's a single Greek word, anupakritas. It means unhypocritical. Unhypocritical. In those days, an actor was called a hypocrite. It's just somebody who wore a mask on stage. And uh, that, that was a hypocrites. That was a, an actor. This is anhupokritas. This is without hypocrisy, no mask. It's genuine, it's the real thing. It's not just the faith of one's lips, it's the faith of one's lifestyle. God said through the prophet Isaiah, these people draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So here's Paul. This is his last letter. He's in a prison. He doesn't have much time on earth left to live. And he thinks of Timothy. First thought, the tenderness, the tears. Second thought, the godliness. And he says, you know, when I think of unhypocritical, genuine faith, I think of your mom, Timothy. It first dwelt in Lois, your grandmother, and then in your mother, Eunice. Godliness. Would you agree that we could uh, use a little more godliness these days? Would you also agree that our culture, our society, is becoming more and more godless every day? And because it's becoming more godless every day, somebody who is godly in a godless society is going to stick out like a blessed, wonderful sore thumb. I'll tell you this. When I first saw genuine faith in someone, unhypocritical faith, in somebody that I personally knew. It made a huge impact. And for me, it was in high school. I remember guys like Dave McCachron, Dino Webster, Gino Geraci, all the cool kids on the campus. Those three got saved. And they got into the Bible, and they had a genuine faith. Not only did they have a genuine faith, they were excited to share their faith with other people. It made a huge impact on me. I'd never seen that. People excited about their faith in Jesus. 
Well, what did this mom teach Timothy as a child? You know, we can find out if you just turn a page to the right, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, just go over to the third chapter. We'll find exactly what Timothy got as a kid. Look at verse 14 of chapter 3. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you learned them. Who do you learn them from? His mom and grandma. How do we know? Watch this next verse. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's what Timothy got at home. Bible teaching, probably Old Testament stories and prophets and the law from the Jewish grandmother and mother that Timothy had. One of my favorite presidents is Abraham Lincoln. Um, I like him, first of all, he had a super cool beard and hat. But, but more importantly, he, he, was, he was a man who held the nation together at a very difficult time in our history. Did you know that Abraham Lincoln, his mother died when he was nine years old? Nine years old, his mother died, broke his heart, shattered his world. Abraham Lincoln said this, all that I am or hope to be, I get from my mother. Now, wait a minute, Abe. You only had your mother for nine years. And you're telling me as the President of the United States, all that you are and have is because of your mother? Well, that's what he said. He said, all that I am or hope to be, I get from my mother. And then he said this, no man is poor who has a godly mother. Nine years of age, mom was taken from him. But he was accurate because the first five years of a child's life are the most impressionable years. It's been determined by experts that 85% of a child's character is developed by the time they are five years old. That's why I always like this quote by Charles Spurgeon, before a child reaches seven, teach him all the way to heaven. And better still, the work will thrive if he learns before he's five. Timothy had that. Tenderness, godliness. Third, third way to invest in your kids to change the world, boldness. Boldness. Look at the last two verses of our paragraph. Verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now I want to emphasize one word especially, and that is the first word of verse 6. Therefore. Therefore takes you back to a previous thought. Therefore points back to Timothy's genuine faith passed down from mom and grandma. So here's Paul saying, when I call to mind the genuine faith that is in you that came from grandma and mom and the tenderness, it makes me say to you, Timothy, you have therefore every reason to be bold. In fact, I would say this, tenderness mixed with godliness will produce boldness. When you have a godly person who's been raised in a tender environment, when they come of age, that gives them a foundation for faithful service and boldness. Now, why does Paul say in verse 6, stir up the gift that is in you? Because let me tell you what that means. It means fan something into flame. Here's the picture. When you light a fire and you let it go, the embers sort of die if you walk away from it. And, and, and so you have that fire that's going out, but if you come up to it and you blow on it or you push air onto it, you fan the flame and it gets big again. That's the word that he uses. So it seems from this and other texts that Timothy was timid, prone to waver, easily intimidated, maybe even a spiritually not as devoted as he once was. Go, go down to verse 8. Look at verse 8 of chapter 1. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. 
Timothy had become a little bit ashamed of Paul. You know, he's the hero of the Christian faith. and He's a jailbird. Go down to chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then, when Paul writes to the Corinthian church, Paul said, if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear. Another translation says, if Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. So it seems that Timothy, by nature, was easily intimidated, prone to waver, fearful, hesitant, maybe even a little apathetic. His spiritual fire had cooled. And on one hand, I, I understand that. And here's how, how I want to explain it. Paul put Timothy in charge of the church at Ephesus. He made him the senior leader, and Paul walked away. It was a tough church. Things were getting hard, getting divisive. There was a lot of opposition. Things were out of order. Timothy needed to set them in order. And I'll just say from a little bit of personal experience that that kind of opposition and difficulty can take the wind out of a leader's sails. And maybe his shoulders were drooping just a little bit. So Paul remembers the godliness, remembers the tenderness that he got from mom and says, now, therefore, toughen up, be bold, stir up that gift. God hasn't given us the, the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I just want to give a, a word of encouragement to all Christians living in the day and age in which we find ourselves. We live in a day and age when boldness is in fashion for everybody else. Every group out there who wants to identify as whatever they want to be is very bold and vocal and think their voices should be louder and you should hear them. I think it's time for Christians to step up and be bold in this culture and have our voices heard. It's not like every other voice except Christians, especially Christians. We turn up the volume. We be bold. So stir up the gift that is in you, which was given you, now, now watch this, through the laying on of my hands. That is, Paul at some point laid his hands on Timothy for service, for ministry. It signifies a holy calling of God. So moms, lay your hands of tenderness and godliness on your kids and pray that in the future somebody else will lay their hands of affirmation on your child for some calling of God. In other words, do what only you can do and leave the rest up to God and watch what He will do. You're planting seeds today. You're nurturing them. You're watering them. They'll germinate in the future. You don't see the fruit right away. But just make sure you add plenty of godliness and tenderness and wait for the boldness that they will exhibit. Timothy's story is what every parent wants to see happen with their children. Uh, if I were to poll parents, I could guarantee you that 95% of them would not say, I want my kid to be a doctor, a lawyer, successful, make a lot of money. Maybe a few would. Most every Christian parent I have ever spoken with in my life says, none of that matters to me. You know what I really want for my kids? I want them to love God and follow God's will for their life, period. <laughs> and so Psalm 127, Solomon wrote, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. That word heritage, children are a heritage from the Lord. One translator puts it, they're an assignment from God. An assignment. It's your homework. I know you're thinking, wait a minute, I graduated. You never graduate from parenthood. It's your assignment. It's your homework. And notice the kids are called arrows. That presupposes that you're launching them. 
It presupposes that you love them, you're tender with them, you train them, train them godly. And then there comes a point where you say, get out. Get out. It's time to get out. You're 35. You're living in my basement. Get out. Go get a life. Go do something. I'm launching you. And it's all about the launch. But to launch an arrow also presupposes there's a target you're launching them toward. And it also presupposes you know what that target is and that you've reached that target yourself. Because did you notice? He said the genuine faith that is in you that was first in grandma and mom. You cannot give, you cannot pass on what you don't have. They had it, they passed it on to him. So moms, we honor you today. Your role is one of the most important roles on planet Earth. And I know your job never ends. My mom worried about me till the day she went to heaven. But your impact, get this, your impact isn't just today or in 10 years or 20 years. It's generations to come. It's generations to come. You're passing on the faith and they will pass on the faith. It's generations to come. It's generational change. And again, as I said at the beginning of this message, this is not just for moms. It's for anybody who has responsibility for someone, which is all of us. We all want to see the world change. So I'm going to throw something up on the screen in closing for all of us. And then we'll close. This is from Howard Hendricks. Neat guy. I got to meet him before he went to heaven. He said, every disciple needs three types of relationships in his life. He needs a Paul who can mentor him and challenge him. He needs a Barnabas who can come alongside and encourage him. And he needs a Timothy, someone that he can pour his life into. And we'll keep that up on the screen for a moment because I'd like that to soak in if at all possible. Every disciple, all of us, followers of Jesus, we all need three types of people. We need a Paul or a Pauline. We need some figure above us who has walked the road before us and can mentor us, counsel us, caution us. But then we need a Barnabas, son of encouragement. Moms are great at this. Saying, you can do this. I believe in you. It's awesome. You need that. But don't let that stop with that. You need someone that you can pour your life into, a Timothy. So here is my challenge, my parting challenge as we leave. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Ready? Here's the challenge. Change the world. I heard a couple laughs. Change the world, that's little. Change the world. One person at a time. One salvation at a time. One conversation at a time. Do it by tenderness. Do it by godliness. Do it by boldness. If you do that one person at a time, one conversation at a time, the world will change. Especially your world will change. Father, thank you for the moms that are in our congregation, the grandmothers that are in our congregation. They put up with so much, so much attitude that we have given our moms throughout our lifetime. All the times when we thought they were dumb and we were the smartest thing on earth, the gift sent from heaven, and they just were there, faithful, loving, encouraging. So many times we've broken mom's heart. But a mother's love and a mother's faith is an irresistible force. And one of the most powerful forces in the world. So Lord, unleash that. Encourage that. And for all of us, Lord, who influence someone, I pray that we would do so by those three elements. A little bit of kind, sensitive tenderness, a lot of godliness, mixed with boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory at calvarynm.church. 
And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.